This next man has been a dear friend and quite frankly, like so many, uh, a mentor. And uh, quite frankly, the simplicity of what you're going to hear him teach in the next 45 minutes will just, you'll just pop yourself on the head with one of those V8 moments and go, this makes so much sense. Why don't they seem to get it in Washington? This gentleman is the president of the uh, Council for National Policy, an organization of which I am a member. He is uh, truly a great patriot and leader in the free United States of America. He is a former congressman from the great state of Ohio. And as a matter of fact, just this last week, President Trump was speaking at the Council for National Policy. And Bob was, in, uh, just after that, invited to a meeting with the president at the White House. So fresh from the White House... And now to Grapevine, Texas. Please give a warm welcome to our next presenter, former Congressman Bob McEwen. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. It's uh, an honor to be with you. I've enjoyed being with you. I want to especially thank our, our host for allowing me to follow E.W. Jackson. And... Uh, <laughs> You all are speakers, and you know exactly how I feel. So I, uh, but it, it's uh, Rick Scarborough and, and, and Art Alley and all of the folks that have made this possible. This is not like usual times. This is not like it is when you say this is, if we don't do this, something else is going to happen. It's already happened. Uh, we are, this is not, if we don't stand up to Hitler, he's going to take all of Europe. He has already taken all of Europe, and you and I have been dropped into the battleground in France. We are surrounded. It's not like someday somebody's going to come up and tell you what to wear. We're living in that circumstance. It's not like some little girls coming up like they did in the Cultural Revolution in China and saying, that person is not behaving properly on the airplane. I'm reporting him. That's what we're experiencing. And so it's important to understand why America was different, how it is at risk at the moment, and how it can be rescued, because you are a very major part of that. Freedom is a three-legged stool. It is economic freedom, political freedom, and spiritual freedom. You can love the Lord and have all kinds of spiritual liberty, but if you are in prison and I have no political liberty, you're not free. Or you can live in a free country and have absolutely no income. The little five-year-old that says to his mother, I'm fed up with things around here. I'm storming out and grabs his teddy bear and goes out the door. His mother looks out the window. He's not going any place. He is tied to that house because he has no economic freedom. He is, though he is tethered. And yet, if he said, oh, by the way, I took the credit cards out of your car, out of, out of your purse, I have $500 in my pocket, and I'm leaving, that's a whole different ballgame. So freedom requires economic freedom, political freedom, and spiritual freedom. Now, in that three-legged stool, if one of them falls, then you've lost liberty altogether. The way that a person comes is through the weakest link. So it will tell the political liberty folks, you don't want to get involved in churches. You don't want to have anything to do with a political fight. You need to ignore that. The spirituality really doesn't have anything to do with making a strong economy. But we're going to see that America understood that that's not the case. So the seminary will tell you, you need to focus your eyes on Christ. You don't need to pay any attention to what people are doing economically or politically. You don't, don't get deviated. Don't, don't pay any attention to that. When you and I understand that it's the political liberty that allows the spiritual liberty to succeed. If the political liberty falls apart, the whole church collapses. Somebody that you don't even know, some little deputy assistant health commissioner of Montgomery County, Maryland, can write a piece of paper and say, you cannot have a Christian school meet during the year 2020 or 2021 elected by no one doing it where does that happen that is called there's a term for that it's called tyranny and when we allow tyranny to supplant the system that our country was founded upon because we didn't know how it worked then it can come and steal it right it out right out from under us and that's what we are experiencing at the moment it's essential for our children and grandchildren and the future of our nation we be aware and how to fix it immediately because we have less than 60 days to do it this little place is called America. is 4% of the population of the world. 4%. Yet every year they write more books, more plays, more symphonies, more copyrights, more inventions than the rest of the world combined. Anything that people enjoy on the planet, like a light bulb or a telephone, a ship in a harbor in Hong Kong or Singapore at this very moment is using a global positioning system conceived, invented, and maintained by Americans. 
A car dealer in Buenos Aires ordering a part from Stuttgart, Germany, uses an internet conceived, invented, and maintained by Americans. Americans are the ones that have created more wealth than the rest of the world combined. And the question is, why? See, they won't focus on this. They'll focus upon inequality somewhere. This person isn't as rich as that person. Well, let me tell you about that person there, that poor person. A person living in poverty in America. The Rector study done by the Wall Street Journal and the Heritage Foundation every 24 months for the last 37 years. A person living in poverty in America compared to the second richest spot on earth, Western Europe. You come to this country, sit down on a park bench, gripe and complain about the country, we will bury you with stamps for food, a roof over your head, a bed to sleep in, unlimited health care for you and anybody you've ever met, unlimited education. A person living in poverty in America is more likely to have a telephone, a television, an air conditioner, an automobile. Eats more meat, has more square footage space than the average resident of the second richest spot on earth, Western Europe. Now you tell these little punks out here spray painting these buildings, they don't know squat about how wealth comes from or where it comes from. And it's essential that you and I understand how that works. Let me focus on this. How does, I, I went to dinner one night and a fellow asked me, he was startled by the fact that people, he would see these pictures of these Jewish families loading their children onto boxcars and there's no guards around, maybe one little Nazi down at the end with a rifle and they say, how, how does this happen? That they, they could have overrun him. And I explained it to him, he went, difference between a speaker and a writer, he went home and wrote a book and uh, sold uh, hundreds of thousands of copies, it's only about that thick, it's called How Do You Kill 11 Million People? And here's how you do it. That is, you use fear. I want to keep you safe. I couldn't tell you, shut down your entire church. You wouldn't do it. You'd be out there fighting. I want to keep you safe. So I want you to shut down your Sunday school and your church. And I want you to send everybody home. And when that family is falling apart and when those kids are disruptive and, I'm, and I need help in prayer, I don't want anybody answering the phone. I, I couldn't sell that. So I use fear. And so they said to him, you need to, you Jews are, are, not everybody likes you a whole lot. So you need to move down to this part of the, uh, the city. We're going to keep you safe. Well, then why are you putting the walls around here? Well, that, that, that's to keep you safe. Well, why are you putting barriers at the, at the entrance here? Well, that, that, that's to keep you safe. Why must I wear this, this gold star? Well, that, you know, not everybody, you know, the police need to know where you are so that in case anybody attacks you, they can keep you safe. And then they bring all the men in, all the fathers, and they say, you know, the war's not going real well. And, uh, and it looks like the, we're going to have to move you. And uh, in order to do that, uh, we want you to know there's going to be a better place. We're going to take you to a place that there's, there's better housing and there's better jobs and better schools. And uh, what we need you to do is to go home. And if you will uh, make an inventory of everything that you have and then uh, tell your children uh, that tomorrow morning, uh, just pe pack enough for one night overnight. And we're going to load you onto the, onto the train and it's going to be very uncomfortable. But your wife is going to react the way you react and they're going to react the way the children are going to react the way they see you. And you need to be calm and understand that explain to them that for a couple of hours, two to three hours, it's going to be very uncomfortable for them. But if they could just... Uh, uh, just hold on, we're going to take them to a much better place. And so they all began to just quietly march up onto the, onto the trains until finally they were gone. Fear hath torments. Perfect love casteth out all fear. He hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now you notice that those are, those are opposites. That, those are uh, antonyms. If you, if you have Fear, you're, not, you're weak. You're not powerful. You cannot power love. You cannot love a person you're afraid of. He's not given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. When you're afraid, you don't think straight. And so, he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love. And a now, if, you give it, if we can get people to think fearfully, then they'll be weak. They won't think straight. And these people... I was back here, these wonderful folks trying to fix us breakfast this morning. I came in a little bit late. They scrambled around and got me some. They're trying to smile with their faces all covered. There's no way. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And so much the more as you see the day appear. And it laying, upon, laying upon of hands. So Satan, my father once said, we really don't need the Bible. You just take what Satan says and do the opposite. He figured out every single thing that he comes up with is the opposite of what God wants us to do. And so... Uh, Here's what I want to say, is that you don't really need to take notes. 
I'm, I'm going to leave most of this out. And if you're interested in following it up, if you just go to bobmcewen.com, all of this is on DVD with the, and you can stop it and re redo it and that kind of thing. So let, let us proceed. We've got two quick points to answer here in the next 20 minutes. Politics is very simple. We only discuss two things. I don't care if you're running in Boston or Baghdad or Buenos Aires. You only vote on two things. The integrity of the person, the value of the, uh, the values that the government holds, and economics. That is, how much do they, do they take from us? Let's walk through it very quickly. Let's quickly do the, the integrity. Integrity is made up of two parts. First of all is morality, not doing what's wrong. Shalt not steal, shalt not lie, shalt not bear false witness, shalt not covet all the things that were on the walls of every school in America for 230 years. However, you can lay in bed all day and be moral. Uh, integrity is more than that. You say that this platform has integrity or a bank has integrity. What does that mean? It performs the task for which it was designed. It is trustworthy, reliable. And if a person is reliable, that means that not only do they not do anything wrong, but they also do what is right. And I call that character, is doing what is right. Daughter comes home from school, everybody's picking on Sally today, calling her fatty, fatty and all. But I didn't do it. I did. That's good. You did not do anything wrong. But did you have the character to do what is right? And that's the crux, and that's where you come in, because this is the foundation for everything else we're going to talk about, and you are the one that decide this. That is, what is right and what is wrong. First of all, you can, you can be a person, a moral person, and lack character. However, you cannot do what is right if you're doing what's wrong. You cannot be a person of character if you're immoral. So, what is the definition of what is right? And that's why now we proceed. There's a starting point at everything, all first principles upon which everything else depends. And that is, as you remember, when Jethro said to, to Moses, you're going to wear yourself out. Therefore, you need to have a federal, state, county, and local government put in charges of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. And here's, I don't have time to teach government to you. I can't give you a, a PhD in, in, in civics. Here's what you need to look for, Moses. Three things. Number one. Those that fear God. Fear is the English term for honor. You fear the king. You honor the king. There are only two choices. Either I'm God or he's God. Period. End of discussion. Now, Satan doesn't come along and just say, uh, he's no good. He just questions. Sir. You know, hath God said? So he starts to question. And you have to make a decision. Am I going to? I think it looks good to eat. I think it would make one wise. I think... And there's the question. There's only two choices. Either what I say or what God says. And what he said is, you don't want someone who thinks they're God. And just as a little aside, you don't want to marry a person who thinks they're God. The Bible says, do not be unequally yoked because you don't want to go into business with a person who thinks they're God. And you don't want to elect a person who thinks they're God. Now that's the only two options. Either we fear, how do you feel about abortion? Well, I think... Or God says. That's the only two. So those are the, and so our founders knew which one to choose. And it works like this. So who says? Every barroom brawl, every schoolyard scuffle boils down to two words. And there's either you believe that man created God or you believe that God created man. Now, if you believe that man created God, then you believe that he is his own standard. If you believe that God created man, you believe God has a standard. If you believe man created God, then you believe that man is basically good. By what standard would he not be good? And whenever you hear someone speak about that man is basically good, then you know which side they're coming on. Because you and I know that man is not basically good. Thirdly, if anything goes wrong, it's not his fault. You can listen. Once you understand this formula, you can listen to a politician for 60 seconds. You can know all you need to know about him. Because if he does something wrong, it's not his fault. Because he's good. And so if somebody comes in and starts shooting people, it's not his fault. He's good. Whose fault is it? Got to be the gun's fault. Got to regulate that gun coming in here doing those nasty things. You know, like I say, you know, if guns kill people, how does anyone ever get out of a gun show alive? So, so therefore, and, and thirdly, well, you and I know that God has a standard and that we're accountable for it. And that is what made the change when they began to read the scriptures for themselves and began to reform the church and man's individual accountability to God, which is the foundation of America. And finally is, here's the most important. Where do rights come from? And just to make it simple, uh, if, I, if I'm telling you about 
salvation and about Christ, and then I say, but all religions are alike, you know, it really doesn't matter, I'm not going to mention it, it just, then I've just taken away the impact of everything I've just said. And so therefore, th there's a, two teams here. One is called, a, they identify themselves as Democrats, the others identify themselves as Republicans. If I don't use those two words, I haven't changed anything, I've just made it more difficult to follow. These people believe that rights come from the majority. They believe, Democrats believe that rights come from a democracy. That is that they vote by the majority. The rights come from the majority so that, that Nancy Pelosi could walk up in the well of the house and say, today we are going to create a right of health care. You and I know, if you can create a right, you can do away with a right. And the term for that is tyranny. And so our founders made it abundantly clear our rights don't come from the group. And these people will always talk about gay rights, women rights, Hispanic rights, African American rights. There are no blonde left-handed rights. There's rights that God gave to all of us. And when you listen to these people talk, then you'll understand. Now let me just tell you, you are a minority. Just remember that. Everyone is a minority. And so when these people band together and think they can go to storming down the street and steal people's things they think because they're in the majority at the moment, our rights don't come from their group. Our daughters spent a year in Rwanda. 80% of the people in Rwanda are Hutu. 20% are Tutsi. 80% voted to kill the 20%, which you can do in a democracy. 80% voted to kill the 20% in over 90 days with machetes. They chopped a million people to death. In America, you can vote 95 to 5 to kill Jews. Can't do it because we're not a democracy. The word democracy does not appear in any of our founding documents. It does not appear in any of the, of the constitutions of the 50 states. It says clearly that our rights come from God. Now, we democratically elect people to run the republic, but that's a whole different ballgame. We are not a democracy. We are a republic that democratically elects people to operate it that have to stay within the constraints of the republic. But let's continue on here quickly. These people, when you listen to them for a few moments, this is the way that they feel. These people will always want more government. They want limited. These people want more taxes. I won't go into it at length. These people, since they are God, they can say that marriage is between two men and a horse. And then they can make it a hate crime for you to disagree with their definition of marriage. And we are, that's not a prediction that I used to make 15 years ago. That is where we are living at the moment, and we need to fight back. And if we continue to stack the courts with people that do this, our children will live in tyranny. We, we are on the cusp of restoring it, and it's essential that we understand that these people... You show me where a person stands on, on p handing out condoms in the classroom, and I will tell you within a 90% certainty where they stand on cutting the capital gains tax. The more you know, but as I say, get the DVD, maybe we've got to continue on here. So, two things. There's fear God and men of truth. Essential that we know, have a standard. There has to be a standard. I can say that this room is 100 feet wide. You can say it's 90, somebody says 85, somebody says 115. We're all happy until someone comes and measures it. And when they measure it, that is truth. Everything else is just opinion. But as long as I've been standing up here saying it's 100 feet and you found out it was, that they measured it, it was only 78, everybody in the room knows that what I said was wrong. Therefore, error hates truth because truth reveals error. There's no other way around it. Truth reveals error. Everything else is just opinion. More than that, more than that, truth overcomes error. So, you're prosecuting this fellow for stealing an ATM machine, and you're in the courtroom, and his, his defense counsel gets up, why, he wouldn't think about doing such a thing, he loves his mother, and he was out having dinner with his sister in Portland, here's the receipts from the restaurant he had, to go on, you don't care what she says, because when you're finished, you're going to show a security camera of him driving his pickup up in front of the ATM, and you'll see him put a chain around the ATM, and you'll see his face as he leans over the camera, and you see the fingerprints as he pushes the button, and the truth will overcome the air such that... The only way she can succeed is to prevent the presentation of truth. Because truth not only reveals error, truth overcomes error. That's why you can't have one conservative speaker on a college campus. You can't have one. You can't have one conservative professor. Because that one conservative professor telling truth will overcome the error of 18,000 of, of the others. <clears throat> That's why you can pray in the name 
uh, at an inaugural of, of uh, Mother Earth and eagle feathers. And uh, you can pray. Nobody cares. But you pray in the name of Jesus Christ and all hell will break loose. Why? Because I am the truth. The truth and truth overcomes error. Therefore, error, Satan doesn't care what you're doing. As long as you've got your eyes off Christ, that does, that's all that matters. I don't care which religion you are. All religions really leave the same place. You just you do all of that all you want because as long as you're not focused on Christ, they do all leave the same place. So, they, uh, so what is truth? So, so our founders got together and they understood all this. And so they wrote it down. We hold these truths. To be self-evident. That, that's the gracious Jeffersonian way of saying any idiot ought to understand this. You'd be blind, deaf, and dumb, bozo. You ought to know this is self-evident, idiot. That all men are created. They didn't just crawl up out of their primordial slime and say, let's write a symphony. No, they are they're in, and endowed by a five to four decision of the Supreme Court. They are endowed by... In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And the word became flesh, and it dwelt among us. Now, who was, who was, who was that? Jesus Christ, or the word, or God, or creator. They're all synonyms. Man is endowed by Jesus Christ. Man is endowed by the word. Man is endowed by God. Man is endowed by his creator with certain inalienable rights. And among those are life. This is the only nation on earth made provision for life. Liberty. Then notice the sequence. See, you... You have, liberty is a precious little value. If you're dead, you have to have life first, then liberty, then the sewer systems and overpasses. And the purpose of government in America is to preserve those rights. And so you have every authorization to ask the candidate for city council, where do you stand on protecting life? Well, now, I'm just a city councilman. I'm just a county commissioner. I'm just running for sheriff. I don't have any... No, 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 no. The purpose of government in America is to protect innocent life. And no, any politician, any politician that will take innocent life will not hesitate to take your liberty. It's a telltale sign. It's as different as night and day. And so where do our rights come from? We said where they came from, they came from God. And that's why the Democrat Party has excised God, first of all, from their platform. And now, even as they began the session by the Pledge of Allegiance, they took out under God because God has a standard and they are dedicated to destroying it. It is the standard upon which America is founded. And the churches are the only ones that are going to point it out. When you want to know something about how to fix it, it where, where does a city councilman go for guidance as to the spirituality of the nation, the importance of the nation? Where does, Wall, does he go to Wall Street? Does he go to the newspaper? Where does he go? He has to go to the pulpits. And the pulpits have been taught by seminaries for now two generations that the noble thing for you to do is just stay underground and, and allow them to steal this lighthouse for the gospel from the rest of the world. Until now, when you do it, if you look around, most of these 30-year-old pastors, they, they, they'll, bold, they'll come at you. They won't even listen to you. They'll turn their back and walk away if you try to talk about their responsibility to their community, the responsibility that God, God put on them. This is the lighthouse for the gospel. If you took... The standard for righteousness in the world is established by America. The scripture says if you take down a city, you have to bind a strong man. There's only one strong man in the world is America. You take down America, the rest of it is a piece of cake. Nobody else can... <clears throat> so when a ship is attacked on the high seas. It's happened over 300 times last year. To whom can they appeal? The 327,000 Americans that wear the uniform of the United States Navy. Rule Britannia. Britannia rules the waves. Rule the waves for 250 years. When their little ship got attacked in the Persian Gulf about three months ago, that great empire that just in our lifetime controlled one out of every four people on the planet had to appeal to Americans to come rescue their ship. The standard for righteousness on the high seas. The standard for righteousness in, in banking. If some bank prints artificial money and, and creates counterfeit money, the American banking system will shut them down and isolate them such that they, can, they can't do it. America stands for what is right. When a ch church opens up, to whom do they appeal for churches, for Bibles and for hymnals? They turn to Americans. If you take all the money that goes for the furtherance of the gospel, for the presentation of global evangelism from the entire planet except America, and put it in a pile and you increased it five and a half times that's still not as much as Americans give every year this is the lighthouse for the gospel and if these kids coming out of seminaries don't know it Satan knows it and he knows if he can shut down this the rest of it is going to be very easy 
And there's a reason why this place has prospered as no nation has ever prospered. The sixth, we, we, we like to take black and white pictures of people sitting in on their front porch in the Ozarks in Arkansas. That's our definition of poverty. The sixth richest nation on the planet. The sixth largest nation on the planet. To over 200 million people. The gross domestic product of that country is smaller than the state of Arkansas. 91 million Filipinos every year produce less wealth than the three and a half million Oklahomans. The list can go on and on. 120 million Mexicans, less than the state of Illinois, etc. Cetera, et cetera. When you, righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. When a righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth the rule, the people mourn. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Our founders knew how to do it. They established it, and now it's been entrusted to us. The question is, are we going to continue to do it? And finally, the three things I'm going to tell you here, Moses. They can't think they're God because they're going to make up their own rules. So they've got to listen to what I said. You already gave them the, the, the book there. They, they can go to the tablets and find out how to do it. They do it their way. They have to be honest and hate stealing from other people. <clears throat> now, God could only name three things. One of the three most important things he could mention was hating socialism. Socialism says, I want what that guy has. I can walk down the street and take whatever. The most evil thing is, we've traveled around a lot, and of course people like to come up to a congressman and say, you know, I've been to America, I've been to America, and anybody that knows my wife knows that she's a gregarious sort. And so she said, well, what surprised you about America or impressed you the most about America? The answer that comes back more than anything else is, you don't have walls around your properties. You don't know where your yard stops and where your neighbor begins. Why? Because in America, we don't covet what other people have. We don't have to protect it. You go right across the Rio Grande, they got walls, they got cut glass on top of the walls. When, you're, when, you, when you don't covet, I tell young people, I've never owned a bicycle lock in my life. I walk out of a school, there's 250 bicycles all around the place. Not one of them has a lock on it. Why? Because we were taught on the wall, thou shalt not steal. All right, my wife tells about a friend of hers walking down the hall with two rifles over his shoulder, walking by the, the principal's office. said, John, where are you going with those? He said, Mr. So-and-so wanted to see my new 30 6 and I was going to show it to him. He said, well, I'd like to see it too. When you're finished, come back. I'd like to see it too. Never dawned on him to shoot anybody. Why? Because thou shalt not kill. It was, it was inculcated. And who, did, who changed that? Not the legislature. The courts did it. And who appoints the courts? And by you and I appointing people who looks nice. I mean, he's, he's, oh, he's going to have a family. Oh, we choose those people who appoint the courts that have changed America and that's what everything is at risk and I'm going as fast as I can I want to get this done if I can in the next 15 minutes uh, so how does a person become rich you need there's only two ways and this is where they get into the church because the compassionate thing to do is to take from this person what would Christ do you know, they, these, these activists my age that used to be long-haired hippie freaks that are now cut their hair and call themselves reverends, and they go around and speak in the Christian colleges. And they say things, you know, Jesus never talked about abortion. Jesus never talked about gay marriage. You know, but, but those right-wingers you know, are trying to divide us, and they're all the time talking about homosexual marriage and about abortion. Who do we want to be like? Do we want to be like Jesus? Just lead those little Fleming, lemmings right off of the cliff. And the way that they get into these pastors, they get in the church, and they say, we're going to teach compassion. There's no reason. Why should this person have ten times as much as this person here? <clears throat> Let's just do it real quickly. Guy, you can live comfortably for fifty dollars a day. One guy's making a hundred dollars a day. A guy sitting on the park bench making zero. And the compassionate numbskull comes along and says, "Why don't we take fifty dollars from this guy? He'll still have fifty dollars left. Give it to this guy. He'll have it. Everybody live happily." And that sounds great. And it works good for the first week. But the second week, this guy says, "Now wait, 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 wait. Let me get this straight." I get up early in the morning, I wear myself out, I come home tired, I get 50 bucks. That guy wakes up when he feels like it, sits on a park bench, does nothing, he gets $50. I think I like his program better. And he goes and sits down with him such that when the communists took over in Chile and said everybody's going to be paid the same, the productivity in the copper mines fell 70% in the first 30 days. See, socialism only destroys wealth every time. Freedom only creates wealth every time. And how does it work? Here, quickly. There's a car going down the street out here. There's only two ways that I can get money out of that car. One is called free enterprise. 
That's where I lay awake nights trying to figure out ways to do something good for a person such that they'll voluntarily slam on their brakes, pull in and say, you're going to clean my car and sweep the carpeting and wash the windows and do the dash. I'd much rather have that than have this $10 bill. I'd much rather have those shoes and have this uh, a global positioning unit. I'll never get lost again. Oh, it's, well, I'd much rather have that than have this $200. And under free enterprise, they create ways to bless another person such that they willfully choose to voluntarily, freely make an exchange which at the end of the exchange, they are both better off. And if they're not, they don't make the exchange. And by the way, that's the only way that wealth is created. And for all of us good Pentecostal folks, we know that if you want to make a point, you've got to say this three times. That is, that is the only way that wealth is created. That is the only way. That, well, I, said, <clears throat> so I said there were two ways that I could get money out of that uh, car there is coercion I just walk over with a gun and say I want it I say the person sitting at the street light I want 50% of everything in your purse and so she reaches in and gives me half of everything in the purse question have we created any wealth no have we redistributed wealth yeah from her to me and so when you hear Democrats talk they always talk about the way wealth is distributed they never talk about creating wealth quite frankly most of them don't know how Excuse me. <clears throat> <Don't>. <laughs> that, that was quiet one. They, they don't know how to create wealth, and so they talk about redistributing wealth because what they do is steal from one group and give to another. You and I know how foolish that is. You drive west, and you go through Iowa, and you see on both sides of the road, corn, as far as you can see, corn, corn, corn. Then you get to Nebraska, and there's wheat, 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 wheat. Then you get, you get to Denver, and you want to run for congress and you say it's really terrible the way corn is distributed in this country and the way that wheat is distributed in this country and you look around you here in denver and there's no wheat and there's no corn you vote for me and i'm going to take that guy's corn and you think you're an idiot corn is not distributed corn is grown wheat is not distributed wealth is not distributed wealth is created and in america we allow people to create it and when the degree to which you steal it is in which they don't create it i have got to around third and headed for home here's the point a person is rewarded in direct proportion to his contribution to others the more you bless the more you are rewarded therefore we honor and respect rich people and everything that you want to do, every church, every art studio, every school, everything that we value is a byproduct of the generosity of the people that created wealth. And to attack those people is the inverse. Only stupid people do that. They take the, second, uh, the fourth richest nation in the Western Hemisphere, Venezuela, with more oil per capita than any place on the planet, and they make them to the point that they're starving to death. People are fleeing as fast as they can. They've lost, the average weight has lost 19 pounds. There are no dogs or cats or animals in the zoo left. They've all been eaten, and that's what socialism can do for any place because you, you attack the wagon pullers and thinking that you, if you shoot the horse, the wagon will go faster. Uh, the, the, the fact is that uh, we reward people when you drive down the road when you drive down the road, you can see the contribution that people have made because people reward them by 5,000 cups of coffee, one return. 50,000 cups of coffee, another return. 500,000. The greater the contribution, the greater the reward. I don't have a whole lot of time more to, to go into it, but here's, here's the second way. As I was going out the door one day, my son said to me, he said, you have that app that tells where your plane's coming in and you can know where your gate is going out the next at the airport. I said, what are you talking about? He said, if you just get this app and you plug in your flights, when you land at Delta, Atlanta or Charlotte or wherever, it will tell you what gate you're coming in and what gate you're going out, and you'll know whether it's what, during the 20 minutes that you're taxing, you'll see if it's right across the hall or how far you have to go and all that. I said, well, how much is it? And we found out it's 99 cents. Okay, question. Why did that person create that app? Did they do that so that I wouldn't get lost in the Atlanta air? No, they don't care what. They hoped that a million people would download their app and they'd become a millionaire. Because under free enterprise, you're rewarded in direct proportion to the contribution you make to others. Now, if the thing doesn't work, you don't make any money at all. But if you do something that figures it makes you a millionaire, then tell those people who are sitting around, uh, rich little kids going around spray painting everything all day, it's none of your business. You could have done the same thing and you can do the same thing, but taking it away from them doesn't make you any better off. But by stealing from the productive, a person is rewarded in direct proportion to their contribution to others. And finally, here's the point. Do I care if that app was made by a six foot eight African American male or a four foot eleven 
Asian female. I don't care at all. Because under free enterprise, not socialism, under free enterprise, you're rewarded not because of who you are, but what you do for others. And under socialism, you're rewarded because of the group that you belong to. And your group is able to steal from this group and that group. And, the, and the, you understand that. Let's, uh, greater the contribution, the greater the reward. And so, uh, very quickly, you will understand that. Uh, let's just look at that again, just to remember. The, well, uh, you'll regret that, brother. The uh, <laughs> final point. Once you see this, this is how I will tell you now how to vote six years from now for governor. Because here's the principle. This is all the economics you'll ever need to know. Assuming that this represents 100% of your income, 100% of the income of any city or state or a nation, or let's say it represents a $100 bill. And you go into Walmart and the most expensive thing in the store is $99. That means that you're completely free to choose anything in the store. Now, let us suppose that someone comes along and takes 25% of it away from you and leave you with 75. What happens? Two things happens. First of all, there's you, some things you can no longer choose to, to purchase. Thomas Jefferson said freedom is having choices. The more choices you have, the more freedom you have. Anybody who's had a debate with a teenager understands how this works. I want my own decision. I want my freedom. Okay. The more choices you have, the more, the more choices I take away from you, the less freedom you have. And... This is very simple unless you're from the New York Times and then this would be a profundity. That is, the more money I take away from you, the less off you are, the lower standard of living. Now, I repeat, unless you went to, got a PhD in economics, you would understand this. When I take money away from you, you're worse off. And so when a person comes along, it takes 50%. What happens? Fewer choices, less freedom, lower standard of living. Suppose someone comes along and takes 25% of the way. What happens? Fewer choices, less freedom, lower standard. Suppose someone comes along and takes it all. What do we call a person who works all day and keeps nothing? That person is called a slave. Now, two people can come and take money away from you. One is called a criminal, has a gun, and can come and take money away from you. The other is called a politician, has a gun, and can come and take money away from you. Here's the point. The impact is the same. So you walk from the pay window out across the parking lot. A fellow comes up, puts a gun in your ribs, says, I want 50% of everything you've got. You go home, sit down with your wife and children. This is how much money we have for food, clothing, and shelter, the kind of vacation we can drive, have, the kind of home that we can live in, the kind of car we can drive. Or you make it all the way to your truck and you open it up and you see Uncle Sam's already been here. Money's half gone already. The impact is the same. So here's the principle. You show me what percentage of the GDP, the gross domestic product, the goods and services produced by any city or any state or any nation. And here's the principle. The greater the freedom, the greater the wealth. The greater the government, the greater the poverty. And it only works this way every time. Once you understand it, you can make any rich place poor, you can make any poor place rich. When Thatcher took over in Europe, in Britain, the place was in abject poverty. The, the British pound sterling had been turned over to the, the uh, International Monetary Fund. They had become a third-rate nation. What did she do? She cut taxes and turned the country around. When she left, it was the fourth largest economy on the planet. You can make any rich place poor, any poor place rich. When I was in the state legislature, we had, Ohio was number one in new job creation. Number one. We, create, we got a, a governor who said we can put a stop to this. By the time our current governor took office, we were 99th out of the 50 states. 99th out of the 50 in new job creation. And for the first time in history, Ohio looked at number 100 and said, thank God for Michigan. But nevertheless, they, uh, we divide the... the when I was in college, they told me it was just because Americans were smart. Here, North Koreans, South Koreans, same heritage, culture, climate, language. North Korea, over the last decade, 10% of the population has starved. Starved. Food, clothing, and shelter. First thing you do is food. They can't even do that. South Korea, the 10th largest GDP in the world. Who did that? Americans did it. At the end of World War II, there's what Nagasaki looked like. America doesn't occupy countries that gives them freedom. And this is what Nagasaki looks like today. At the same time that Nagasaki looked like that, the richest nation, the richest city in the history of mankind was a place called Detroit, Michigan. They elected a racist in 1957 and said, I'm going to do this according to the group and not according to rights. And now... Uh, 
Detroit is the poorest city north of the Rio Grande. You can make any rich place poor or any poor place rich. If you don't want your tax dollars to help the poor, then don't stop saying you're a country based on Christian values because you aren't. And this group understands far better than others that there are three institutions created by Scripture. There are 471 references to helping the poor. Two-thirds of them talk about the church. Pardon me. Two-thirds of them talk about you and me. A third talk about the church. And then I always say to people, look, I'm a politician. If you can find I don't need a chapter. I don't need a book. I'll take a, I'll take a verse anywhere where God ever called upon a politician to use the police power of the state to steal from one group and give to another, and he gets points. Brother, sign me up. I'm for that program. But you can't find one. That, that, that is unlike the truth. That is that we... Uh, reward people because of who they are. Now, let's, let's, this Constitution was made for moral and religious people. It's wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Let's talk about this slavery bit just a bit. Prior to the founding of America, 1776, prior to that, slavery was ubiquitous. It was everywhere all the time. When Benjamin Franklin came with no money, he had to become a slave. He had to sell himself in, 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 into uh, he had to become an indentured servant for a period of time in order to get enough money in order to be able to, to, to go out on his own. That's the way the system worked until free enterprise. And under American free enterprise, we began to say two things. Number one, rights don't come from your money or how much land you own or your bloodline. They come because God made you and anybody can then pursue it the way they can. And the people that ended that such that after these people, from then on, slavery was anathema. Slavery previous was ubiquitous. Now it becomes anathema. And who were they? They were Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and James Madison and James Monroe and, and Alexander Hamilton and Benjamin Franklin and John Adams, the finest people in the history of mankind that changed the world for all time. And people all over the world have, have admired them because after that, they put an end to slavery. And you have to have this much history understanding to say, oh, but when they were born, they had slaves. What about when they died? When they died, they gave them all victory, they gave them their freedom because they changed it during their lifetime. And rather than say, you're here and you don't know how to own a home, buy a piece of property, I'm going to teach you how. I'm not going to throw you out on the street. I'm going to take care of you until I'm done. And when I'm done, I'm going to give you what we have. And that's what they did. And we honor those people. They should be respected. And, and these people run, but now... The riots that are going on at this moment that New York Times took credit for called them the 1619 riots for because they're so proud of themselves because this once American newspaper said that America was not founded in 1776 by these great men that you and I know. It was founded in 1619 by people they cannot name. And they said because long 170 years. You know when that was? 170 years ago from now. That's what? 1850? Now tell me what was going on. In eight, tell me what someone did in 1850 that impacted your life today. Well, the fact is what happened 170 years before America was ever formed was not our responsibility. The fact is what we did was to, was to say that man was made by Almighty God, which changed everything, and we honor those people. And if they can only take that down and destroy that, then they can destroy the hope that is America. Because once you've done that, then there is no, uh, there is no hope for the rest of the world. It was, it was Christmas Day. And uh, America had not had any victories. They'd gone from 25,000 troops down to 7,500 that were hanging around because their enlistments were up on January 1st. If they left now, they wouldn't get anything at all, but they were too sick to walk or even march. And, and George Washington said, how many of you can stand? And they said 2,400 of them could stand up. And so he and his prayer partner, Benjamin Rush, had come down from New York. And he said, we've got to have a victory of some sort. And they said, here's what we're going to do. Why don't we go down and we'll cross the Delaware on Christmas Eve and we'll attack the folks in Trenton. And at that, by doing that, we'll get enough supplies and material that we'll be able to succeed. And so they, uh, they decided to do it. And uh, they said, how many of you can stand? And only 2,400 of them could, were healthy enough to march. They began to march in horrible conditions. They're Boots fell apart. They wrapped them in burlap, and they could fall them because of the blood in the slant in the sand. But uh, the day before, on February or on uh, December 23rd, a fellow by the name of Thomas Paine had written this this column that Washington liked, and I'll, I'll read the first paragraph so that you'll identify where it is, and I'll tell you why I'm reading it. it. Said these are the times. He told these guys these are the times that try men's souls. 
They haven't had a victory. Everybody's abandoned them. They're sick and ill, and it's an idea that nobody's ever had before, that just because God made you. He said, this summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of the country. But he that stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of men and women. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation, that the harder the conflict, the greater the triumph. And what we obtain too cheaply, we esteem too lightly. Dearness alone gives a thing its value. Heaven knows how to put a proper value on its goods, and it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. Let's go down four paragraphs. He then says this, thinking about us today. "'Tis surprising to see how rapidly a panic will sometimes run through a country. All nations and ages have been subject to them. Britain trembled at the report of a fleet. The whole English army, having just finished ravaging the kingdom of France, panicked and petrified with fear, were driven back by a few broken forces collected and headed by a woman, Joan of Arc. But things about panics, in some cases, have their uses. They can produce as much good as hurt. Their duration is short, and the mind grows with them. Their advantage is this. That that both things and men are brought to light, which might otherwise have lain forever undiscovered. You and I can see who, in our organizations, would give the word to an entire, to, to an entire denomination. Shut down your church. Christ ambassadors, they don't need to meet. Sunday school, no more. There are people in positions of spiritual leadership that have done that to allow our country to do that. The abortionists, brother, the next week, they went to court. They're going to fight and they stand up. You're not going to shut us down. We said, no. I have a friend that in his denomination, south of, he's from California, he wanted to find someone in his denomination, 415 churches south of Fresno, couldn't find a single church that was willing to open. Panic and fear allow people to do things that we will have to, on the, on the cusp, are very dangerous. Why is this going on? The reason it's going on is because America is right at the cusp of an unbelievable breakthrough. The Republican Party has been controlled by a handful of manipulators at the very top that shot the Bible-believing conservatives, did it by freezing off their money. So we always had these these wet noodles that we had to push up, up the wall. And when they got there, even when we won, you can't see a blip on what they did. And you and I didn't do this, by the way. God gave us president that said you know that stuff there's nothing that says in the constitution we can't have the ten commandments on the wall i'm going to appoint judges that'll put it back on the wall in fact and to let me prove the point there is a thing called the bladensburg cross it was put there in 1919 at the end of the first world war with the names of everybody in bladensburg maryland that was killed in the war and so when the Bolshevik, leftist, Democrats, whatever you want to call them, when they sued to take that cross down and the court said, absolutely, we can't have a cross out there where people can see it. So they go to the appellate court of the several states and the court said, well, let me tell you, just don't be over radical here. If you cut the arms off the cross, then you can leave it if it just goes straight up until it gets to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled five to four, five to four, because the four that two from Clinton and two from Obama, you never have to worry about where they stand. They're going to vote in lockstep every single time. So when they got there and they voted five to four and said, not only can you leave that cross there, but that was based upon the Lemon decision. And the Lemon decision was said in 1971 that the coaches couldn't pray with their, with their team. And there's nothing in the Constitution. The Lemon decision was improperly decided and has been wrongly implemented ever since. And three-fourths of the opinion was taking down the Lemon decision. Now, here's what happens. This, the things that have taken America off track are in the process of coming back. And the top of the Republican Party that ran that folks for long, they're out there screaming and yelling because this guy not only doesn't, know, doesn't want them, he doesn't know who they are. And they're mad and they're about to commit suicide. Now, as for those that have been running the, the, the country, those, the, the, the institutions that 
took money in the last 25 years, took money that you and I used to put in a local bank and we got to borrow a car or a house or a church with it. You can't, I'm part of an organization that gives money for churches because it's virtually impossible for a church to, build, to borrow money anymore because so much foreign money has come from the Middle East that they veto any loans to churches. And so our, our country has become trapped by that. And one man says, you're taking all of that money out of Main Street, where it used to be there, and you've shipped it to, to New York. You then package it and send it to China to build overpasses and factories and, build, and, and you've denuded all of America and I'm fed up with it. And he was the only one that said that. And, and as, a, as a consequence, over these last three and a half, you go to the Federal Reserve of St. Louis. You can Google it. Look at the median income for Americans. 1996, 2006, 2016. It's exactly flat. Within $200, 20 years later, the Americans are absolutely flat. The Chinese are growing at 6 and 9%, and they're about to overtake us. And something intervened in 2016. And somebody said, that's bad. I don't, I don't, want, I don't want that happening. And so the net income, <clears throat> pardon me, the, the income of the average American jumped $5,300 in 38 months as it began to restore. And the, the stock market in America jumped 50%. 50% and the stock market in China went down 40%. So look, the difference is, and the question is, we're going to continue and America is going to be the strongest, most prosperous nation on earth, or it's going to go back to where they are. And it all rests on us in this, this next 60 days. And finally, I'll give you one more quick example as to what the future is. You want to talk about helping the poor, helping the poor, all these little kids going around spray painting your church and telling you you can't meet. I want to talk about helping the poor. Well, there's a 28% tax on all American cars going in the European Union. And instead of having some weak kneed lily livered, bubble mouth politician, we had a, a New York businessman. He said, 28%, that's good. I think we can use that. And scared the living daylights out of those people. And my wife and I were in Brussels at the head of the European Union on the day that Germany, now Germany doesn't make a whole lot of things, by the way. It's got a great economy, but it makes Audis and it makes BMWs, it makes Volkswagens, it makes Mercedes, it makes glass, rubber, and steel to do it. It's a car manufacturing company. And when the, when the country and when the president said, we're going to put 28%, you put 28% on every BMW, that thing is in big trouble. And so they went to Brussels and said this. They said, the German Automobile Manufacturers Association petitioned the European Union to drop the tax on American cars to zero. Amen. Now the question would be, why did they do that? Did they do that because George Bush sent them a Christmas card? Did they do it because, because Barack Obama went to Berlin and said, we're just nasty people. We should have never come over here and shed our blood keeping give you free. I mean, we're just arrogant people. No, no, they did it because a businessman said, you want 28% on you? We'll put on us. We'll put 20% and 28% on you. And so they voted to go to zero. They came to the, pre to the White House at, at last year, December 5th. They met with the president and said they want to make this proposal. And you know what the president said? I think I got to think about that. <laughs> Because he knows that the second he gives them cars, they're going to nail us again on, on, uh, on uh, uh, everything else. They'll do everything else. So <clears throat> we now are at, at the cusp. <clears throat> Pardon me. Economically, militarily, politically, and spiritually, we were at a crossroads that Satan is scared to death. Because the possibility of the future is greater than it's ever been in our lifetimes. It's now within our grasp. We must continue to pray and do what is possible. God bless.